Amen. How marvelous indeed is the name of Christ. Amen? Amen. If you would open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 17, the Gospel of John chapter 17, verse 22. And this ser sermon today and next Sunday's sermon will be the final two sermons as we study through John 17. Last night my wife was asking, she said, uh, are you ready for this morning? And I said, no, but a preacher is never ready. And a preacher can always say more. And sometimes I know you wish the preacher would say less. But one thing I'm reminded of is opening the word of God is that I've dedicated hours and hours this week to just teaching and rolling back the beautiful majesty of God in just two verses, three verses, 22, 23, and 24. It has taken all of my intellect, which is not that much anyway, but it's taken everything I am just to understand this little bit of God that he's revealed to himself. And when I think about how much it requires of me to understand God in just a few verses, can we comprehend a God who is infinite? That if this takes so much of our time and energy just to understand and behold a little bit of his majesty, what will it be like in eternity when we truly see him as he is? This morning we're going to be journeying into getting a glimpse, a little more of a deeper glimpse into the radiance of God. In Exodus chapter 34, we pick up on a story, or not a story, it's a historical account, of course. Moses is leading the people of Israel out of Egypt. God leads them through Moses to Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, God descends in fire and thunder and in majesty and smoke and brimstone. They're on the top of Mount Sinai. And then Moses journeys up into Mount Sinai. So majestic is God's presence that at one point where Moses asks God, let me see your glory. God says, you can see my back, but you can't see my face. And as I pass by, Moses, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of this mountain. I'm going to put my hand over you to shield you from my glory. And as I pass by, you will behold my back because no one can see my face and live. And yet God said that Moses was one whom he spoke to as a friend. And when Moses came down out of Sinai after beholding the radiance of God, he walked down and all the people went, <gasps> and took a step back. Because Moses didn't know, it says in verse 29, that his face shined. It was shining like a flashlight because he'd been talking with God. And when the people saw his face shining, they were afraid to come near him. Now their fear is justified because I haven't seen many shining faces in my life. Don't know about you. But it was probably more than just simply the physical reality that Moses' skin, his body, had somehow during that time absorbed the majesty of God, absorbed the brightness of his character, so that physically, as he walked back down, his physical body was exuding the reality that he'd been in the presence of the Almighty. People drew back because when they saw that, they were confronted with glory and holiness even through Moses, and confronted with their own lack of holiness. Moses radiating God confronted people with where they were at, but at the same time it gave him authority. Because they said, truly here is a man who has been with God. And so Moses expounded what God had told him, and the people listened because they knew that Moses had been with God. Moses literally radiated the presence of God to the people around him. If you remember also in Acts chapter 4 when the apostles stood before the Sanhedrin and they were surprised, the Sanhedrin was the Jewish Sanhedrin, at their wisdom and at their eloquence and they took note that these men had been with who? They took note that they had been with Jesus. There was the weight of heaven upon them. There was the fragrance of God upon their vestiture so that people, when they were confronted with the radiance of God through them, they were forced, frankly, to a reaction. A reaction of recognizing a holy God through this witness. But also this person, there's something about them that I don't have. There's something unique. They have been with God in a way that is powerful, and that can be a powerful witness. 
Moses radiated the glory of God. And as we come to John 17, the joy that Christ gifts us in John 17 and 13 is a joy that is meant to glory in the radiance of God and project and exude the radiance of God. A joy that takes pleasure in showcasing the majesty and the righteousness and the goodness of God. Joy is missional because when we truly radiate God, like Moses radiated God coming off Mount Sinai, the world looks and says, what's going on? What's different about them? John 17, Jesus is praying for our joy. If you remember that in previous uh, studies here the last couple of weeks, that our joy is first rooted in God, the first half of John 17. And then Jesus prays in verse 13, and he says, these things have I spoken in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. And that this joy propels us to mission to grow in the power and the holiness of the Spirit because we're not of this world. And Jesus prays that we would be sanctified by the Spirit. That the, the joy propels us to mission not only to grow into and to continually be walking in the Spirit, but to go in the name of the Son. Jesus says, Father, as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them to bear my glory that the world may believe. And today we come to the ninth affection that joy glories in the radiance of when we sit and enjoy the warmth of Christ and we take in that warmth and that glory that it will shine forth into our lives, into the lives of other people and that people will see truly these people, this man, this woman has been with Jesus. If you think about it this way, We've had a couple of cold days the last week or so. Now, cold for me is 70 degrees. I'm bundling up. But there was a specifically cold day a couple days ago. It was windy. It was gray outside. And I walked out into the yard for just a few moments. And when I walked out into the yard, all of a sudden, the clouds opened just for a few moments. Sunlight came down. And I felt immediately the warmth of that sunlight. The warmth of that sunlight lifted my countenance. It actually physically made a difference in my countenance because it just felt good. Even doctors today tell you that you need to get a certain amount of sunlight because it's healthy. It keeps us from being depressed. Well, if the physical sun can so much lift my countenance just by the little bit of warmth through the peak of that gray, that gray day, think about what being in the radiance of the presence of the Son of God does to warm and to lift our countenance so that people see truly there is something different about these people. Joy is rooted in God. It propels us to mission, but we are to be people who radiate Christ, who delight in the Son of God, who delight in being in his sunlight, if you will, and radiating that warmth to others. Here's a simple question. Do you delight in the Son of God? Does your joy in Christ cause you to want to sit in the warmth of his presence like Mary, when Martha was so busy running and doing everything, but Mary sat there at his feet and just took in? Do you delight in his presence? We're going to ask seven questions this morning. Seven questions asking do you practically demonstrate a life that radiates Christ? Now, this is meant to be intentionally very practical because Jesus is very practical in these three verses that we're about to look at. In the seven questions, by the way, I'm going to spend more time on certain questions than the others. So don't panic when I'm still on one and you think we still have six more of these. Let's read John 17, verse 22, all the way down to verse 24. Jesus is praying to his father. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. The glory that you've given me, O oh Father, I have given to them 
And this joy, therefore, is to radiate that glory that has been given in Christ. You know, glory is a pretty frequent theme all the way through John 17. Jesus prays that the Father will glorify him so that the Son can then glorify the Father. When we say glorify, used as a verb, we mean to take pleasure in. I, I, I want to I take pleasure in or to clothe in splendor. The Son says, Father, will you clothe your Son in splendor so that the Son may clothe you in splendor? The splendor, Father, that you have given me the joy and the delight and, the, and, and the, the glory that you have given me, I give that splendor to them. Here begins our first question. Do you love his church? If you want to radiate Christ, well, the first question I ask is, do you love his church? Practically, you want to radiate Christ to the world, you want to, you want to enjoy that warmth, and you want to be able to project that warmth to others? Well, here's the first question. Do you love his church? This is not just simply a, a question about here and now. But it is to the church that the Son of God has given his glory. The church is the standard bearer of God's glory. Look at this, verse 22. The glory you have given me, I have given it to them, plural, that they may be one united in covenant community with one another. The Son of God himself has placed his glory within the church. The church is to be the one that bears the glory of God to the nations, the splendor, the radiance of the Son to the nations. And this is why Jesus says, the gates of Hades, hell, death, will not prevail against my church because they bear my name, my glory. Do you love his church? I fear that many of us do not. And I think in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who was an eminent theologian in World War II, who became a martyr at the end of World War II, he said this about the church. He said, to Protestants, the church has the sound of something infinitely commonplace more or less indifferent and superfluous. That does not make their heart beat faster. It's something which a sense of boredom is so often associated. And I think that pretty much captures even how many Christians feel about church. It's not a church where you come to see the glory of God. It's some place where people up on the stage are striving through the music and the humor of the preaching and the programs and the dramas and whatnot, not that any of those are necessarily in and of themselves bad, but are struggling to maintain the attention of the audience instead of introducing the people of God to the glory of God through the power of the word of God. When we see his glory and we understand what we've been given, it should enrapture our hearts. The church is a place that God has uniquely chosen to place his glory. If you think in the Old Testament, the Shekinah glory of God was placed where? In the temple. That glory was to radiate to the nations and draw the nations to the nation of Israel. Come Jesus Christ on the scene. The veil is torn in two at the cross. The Holy Spirit is now gifted to his people in a unique way to bear his glory. And now the glory is not in a temple building, but the glory is given to the church. Not this structure, but in you, in me. That we, the people of God, are the bearers of God's glory to a lost and dying world. That we are lights in a dark world. Jesus has given you his glory. But do you love his church? That church that he loves so much and where he's placed his glory? The church, according to Acts 20, verse 28, that he obtained with his own blood? Because the church is precious to the Son? The people of God are precious to the Son. It is the special dwelling place for God's glory, the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Paul speaks to the Corinthian church, which, by the way, had lots of issues. But in spite of their issues, he tells them, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Now, we sometimes take this as a personal thing. I 
Nathan Smith, you, whoever you are, you are the temple of God. But that is not scripturally true. You cannot be the temple of God by yourself. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Ephesians 2, all of these are in the plural. Do you not know, plural, that you, plural, together are the temple of God? That you cannot radiate God's glory by yourself. Did you know that? That the glory of the temple is found in the culmination of all of the bricks which are built together to make a temple together. You are a brick in the temple. You are not the temple. You are a part of what God is doing to build a temple among his people to bring himself glory, but you are not self-sufficiently the temple and capable of bringing glory to God by yourself. You need each other. We need each other. My gifting is leadership under teaching. That's how God has equipped me, and I exert that through my preaching and as a pastor here at the church. And I don't say that arrogantly. I just know how God has equipped me. But I also know that there are some of you out there that are amazing evangelists in ways that I am not. Amazing servants, amazing givers, amazing encouragers. I cannot glorify God by myself up here. I need you and you need me and you need each other. We are all bricks together in the temple of God. Turn around, look at the person right behind you. I'm like, stare them in the eye. I, I'm serious, this is, not, this is not rhetorical. Look around and tell them, wait, listen, tell them you are a brick. You are a brick. Now tell them this. I cannot glorify God fully without you. Tell them that. I cannot glorify God fully without you. You're going to walk away this morning. You've called a bunch of people bricks. And frankly, you're a bunch of shabby looking bricks too. Because God delights in using imperfect, weather-worn bricks to build a holy temple to bring glory to the craftsmen. But we need each other. We are a church. Do you love the church? The place where God has placed his special presence and glory. You say, well, you say I can only glorify God with other people? What if I'm the only Christian? What about that guy up in North Africa who is the only Christian in his city? You know what? I've met that guy in North Africa who's the only Christian in his city. You know what he said? He said, I have a fervent desire to tell people about Jesus because it's lonely and I know I can't do this by myself. Sometimes the awareness that there we are the only light propels us to evangelism. But let's be frank, Heritage Baptist Church in Lynchburg, we are spoiled by the abundance of Christians. We're not propelled to evangelize. We're not propelled to share people about Christ because frankly, we don't need any more people. We got, look at all these people we got. But I promise you, if you were the only person in Lynchburg, the only believer in Lynchburg, you would have a fervent desire to say, I need other people. You say, I can, I can glorify God in, in my car. I can worship him with song by myself. I can, attend, I can attend those worship concerts. I can listen to good sermons from some of the most preeminent and theologically faithful preachers in the world. Yeah, you can do all that. But you cannot bring glory to God by yourself. You need the church. God's designed the church to be the standard bearer of God's glory. And we gather here, not just simply out of ritual, but because together we are being built up as a holy temple. Now you say, but the church is so imperfect. It's got issues. Amen, I agree with you. And you know what? Sometimes when you walk into the church, the stench of sin is very present. But you know what? We are a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. And when you go into hospitals, sometimes they smell. The scent of death, the scent of struggle, the scent of of lives that are hanging in traction. 
the scent of real brokenness and heartache and pain. And yet that is what the church is to be. There should be a stench of sin because sinners are coming in and finding hope in the great physician to find wholeness. And that's what we're about as a church. We are a broken church full of broken people. You know what, people sometimes ask me, say, but, but pastor, we're not, we're made whole in Christ. And you know what, you're right, we are. So sometimes people wonder, why do you keep saying that? We're a broken church full of broken people. Because here's, here's the point, is I know that in Christ right now, I am spiritually whole. But I also know that until I am glorified in heaven with my Lord, this Nathan still struggles with the pettiness of sin. And so I need believers in my life, brothers and sisters who are gonna love me and give me a swift kick in the pants occasionally and sometimes a shoulder to cry on and sometimes a hug that says, keep going. We need the body. This is where God has chosen to pray, place his glory. He is delighted to set his glory in imperfect bricks that he's using to build a holy church. In Ephesians chapter two, verse 21, Paul says, in whom the whole structure being joined, it's not done yet, it together grows, it's not done growing yet, into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are being built together into a dwelling place for God. We are a temple under construction. We are not perfect. We're pursuing perfection in Christ. But this church is imperfect and it's still being built up. And I love the church. I love the church because I am reminded continually of the amazing saints that God has brought into my life. In Psalm chapter 16, verse three, David says this, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. David calls the saints in the land, his brothers and sisters in God, excellent ones. Now here's another exercise. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are an excellent one. Do it right now, right now. You are an excellent one. You are an excellent one. Do you love the church like Christ loves his church? If you love the church, then you esteem his glory that he has placed in the church. The glory you've given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one. Number two, do you reverence his name? Do you love his church? Do you reverence his name? The glory that you've given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one. The name of God and the glory of God are bound up together. They are inseparable concepts. But notice this, the glory you've given me, I've given to them for what purpose? That they may be one. I have placed my glory in the church that they might find unity, oneness, wholeness, not in the programs of the church, not in the, the, the frailties of man's programs, but the thing that binds us together, church, is a firm belief in the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ. Do not come to heritage because you like the music. Don't come to the heritage because you like the pastor's haircut. I don't think anybody's doing that. Anyway. <laughs> come to heritage because this is a place where the glory of God is held high. Find a church where you love his glory, where, where, where you want to see his name esteemed and reverence. So if you reverence his name and that reverencing his name, the outflow of that glory results in unity, then guard the unity of the church. Guard his name by guarding the harmony in the church. Listen to this, his glory shines brightest. If his glory is given so that we might be unified, that's the anchor point that unifies us. His glory then shines brightest when the body is in corporate harmony. That's when his glory shines brightest, when he, when he sees his people. How beautiful when brothers and sisters love each other in the Lord. When in John chapter 13, Jesus said, this is how people will know you are my disciples if you want love one another. 
to love one another, to esteem one another, to cherish one another. And this guards the harmony of the church, but most importantly, it guards and reverences the name of God. Because let me ask you this question. When division enters in, who is hurt first? Is it the one about whom you are gossiping about? Is it the one whom we are tearing down with our attitude or our cold shoulder? Or is it the name of Christ? See, division hurts the name of Christ before anything else. Division hurts the glory of God before anything else. He says, I want them to be one, just like we are one. That when we live together in harmony, we exhibit that beautiful Trinitarian harmony of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, never out of sync, always enjoying, loving, and cherishing one another. If God's glory is tied to our unity, and by the way, in John 17, Jesus talks about unity three times. This is a major theme for him. He wants his people to be one. If God's glory in us is tied to our unity, is it any wonder why Satan is working overtime to sow seeds of division? Why the number one reason missionaries come off the field is because of other missionaries? One of the number one reasons that people leave, not one of the, is the number one by a long shot, the reason that people leave the church is because of other Christians? Turn around your perception. They're a sinner just like you learning to walk in holiness. Number two, there's also gonna be that Satan-appointed individual whom Satan places to say the exact wrong thing at the exact wrong time. I always tell my new, the New Connections class, I say, listen, you're coming into Heritage, you're gonna meet someone in the hallway who's gonna say the absolute dumbest thing at the moment, at the moment where it's gonna feel the most painful. And you're gonna walk out of here going, what a bunch of hypocrites this church is. But if you learn to expect that there's gonna be broken people in those hallways that you meet, and that Satan is gonna, don't give them a softball, don't say I'm only gonna be here as long as relationships are good. If you can learn to look out for that, I promise you'll get plugged in, that you will enjoy deep community here. Every single new connection, someone comes up and says, Pastor, I met that Satan-appointed person. <laughs> I don't know whether to say, praise God, you recognize it, or I'm sorry that you met them, right? And for all of us, may we never be that. Because our words should be seasoned with grace, seasoned with the love of God in everything that we do. Do you reverence his name and guard the unity of the body? Jesus says, my glory I give that they may be unified, that they may be one, even as we're perfectly one, one in us. The modern church gets it wrong. If you want to attract people, then do all of these frivolous things. If you want to attract people to God, show them there his glory. Show him who he is. Show him his loveliness. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus, I am telling you, he is not just a God worthy to be served because he is mighty. He is worthy to be served because he is lovely. He's delightful. He speaks into the very deepest crevasses of our pain and our hurts and our wounds. That is who our God is. He does it with such gentle, tenderly love. There is no other God like this. If you love God, then love his church. And if you reverence his name, guard that unity within the church. Do you ache for the world to know him? Number three, do you ache for the world to know him? Because he says this, I've given them my glory that they may become one, perfectly one. And their unity, I've given them this glory and this unity so that, here's the purpose, that the world may know that you sent me and loved me, even as you love me. I give them my glory so that they may be unified and one in us. And I, they are to be one in us so that the world may know. Our unity and love as believers together our harmony is one of the greatest tools and weapons of witness into this dark world. If someone comes into the church and they say, look at these people, they hate each other. They're bickering. They're divided. That's one of the worst testimonies that we can possibly project as believers. When we look at 
the world around us. Do we ache for the world to know him? Because Jesus' glory is not just something to be enjoyed. It is missionally given. This glory is meant to yield a testimony that the world will see that we have been with Jesus. They will see the shining faces, the glory of God upon our vestiture and say, surely these people have something I do not. Do you ache for the world? We're a bunch of scraggly, imperfect bricks that God is building into a holy temple. And that holy temple is meant to draw in people from the world to showcase who our God is. Number four, so do you cherish his humiliation? I've given them my glory that they might be unified and that this unity and harmony is a testimony to the world that you sent me. The son was given all the glory of heaven. The son gave up that glory, Philippians 2. Humbled himself and humiliated himself to the cross. By giving up that glory, going to the cross, that becomes then the avenue with which he gifts us his glory. That's giving God, I love this, giving God. He gives up his glory to give us his glory. And that doorway into which we receive God's splendor, his beauty, his delight, that satisfaction, is through the cross. So if you love God, you wanna radiate God, if you love his church, if you love the harmony of the body, you wanna see the world see Christ, then you've got to cherish his humiliation, what he did unto the cross in order to give you everything. Look at this, the message of mission, if you will, is what God has given us, empowered us with, so that we might tell the world that the Father has sent his son this son that is humbled has humiliated himself in order to give us something that we didn't deserve. So do you love his humiliation? Number five, do you celebrate his Trinitarian love? That the world may know that you sent me and that you loved them even as you've loved me. Here's the second component. Do you love his Trinitarian love in that? Th 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 this, is, this is one of the most majestic portions of the entirety of scripture, I am convinced, because here we are told that the love that the Son loves us with, the love that the Father loves us with, the love that the Spirit loves us with, is not just any love. It's not just a love for a sinner. It's not just a love or a compassion, but the very love that the Father has for his Son. Get this. For all of eternity, the Father has been pouring out his love on the Son and the Son reciprocating and pouring that love back to the Father. For all of eternity, the Trinity has enjoyed ceaseless satisfaction and harmony and joy and compassion and fellowship and enjoyment. And that very love that the Father has had for the Son for all of eternity, because the Son humiliated himself on the cross, because he clothed us in his righteousness, because we are now hidden within Christ, the love that the Father has for the Son is the same love that the Father now has for us. You are loved by the Father with the same love that he has for the Son of God. What type of love is this? This, this Trinitarian love? It's, it's an eternal love. It's a love without end. It's an infinite love. It's a love without limits as God himself was without limits. It is a perfect love. It's a love without deficiency. That's the kind of love that God the Father loves you. Because if you're in Christ, you are in his son. Number six, do you long to be with him? Do you long to be with him? You see, Jesus says, I pray, O oh Father, and I want you to know, Father, that the glory that you gave me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one. So that through that unity, the world may know that you sent me, that I humbled myself, humiliated myself, so that they might have access into the love 
that you have for me, Father. And now, Father, I want them home. This is the son's cry. Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Do you long to be with him because he longs to be with you? See, this boggles my mind. This is a God that can't wait for you to come to heaven because he misses you, because he wants your presence. The only reason that he forgoes your presence right now is in the previous verses, I pray that you'll protect them, keep them from the world. I'm gonna forego my delight in bringing them home so that they can be a witness and so that others might believe through their word. He forgoes his delight so that we might live out the mission of proclaiming his name. If you, let me put it this way, if you are disobedient and not proclaiming who he is, you're wasting the delight of the son. That delight that he cherishes to bring you home, that he's foregoing in order to keep you here, in order to proclaim his name. Father, I want them to come home. I want them to see my glory. I want them to see who I am. Think about this. Moses could not behold the face of God. But because we are in Christ and made holy in Christ, now Jesus says, I want them to come. I want them to see me for who I am. I don't want them to see my back. I want them to see my face. I don't want them just to experience me from afar. I want them to experience me close up. I will withhold nothing from them. Father, bring them home. The, the parallel here, humanly speaking, frankly, is sexual union. Now, Hear me out. Sexual union is something that God has created. Sexual union is the culmination of the closeness of two people becoming one flesh. What sexual union is meant to exhibit is that two people who've covenanted themselves in love, sexual union is now the culmination of that love demonstrating that nothing is withheld. Everything is given. Now that's why pornography and affairs and the cheapening of the sexual union created by God to be holy is such an affront to God. Because sexual union is something meant to be given as I am withholding nothing as an expression of love. And when we take in order to gratify our desires, it turns it all upside down. And not a sexual way, now hear me out, not a sexual way, that would be blasphemy but in an infinitely deeper way. Here is the Son of God inviting us into his love and saying, I am holding nothing back. You see but a glimpse of my glory. But Father, I want you to bring them to see my full glory. I want them to see my face, the place where angels themselves do not dare to tread. I withhold nothing back. I'm gonna show them my glory, the glory that I have with you before the world, the glory that you have showered on me from before creation. I'm holding nothing back, God. I want them to come home to see who I really am. Right now, we get a glimpse of the face of God. Really, we just get a glimpse of the back of God like Moses did, just little snippets of his glory here in the majesty of his revelation. But Jesus wants to bring us home so that all of that will roll back and the veil will be torn aside and we will see a majestic God for who he is and that is why we will stand and create in eternity forever and ever saying worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb because he is beyond all description. Majesty, beauty, delight. Heaven is so much more than your new body is so much more than a mansion by the celestial sea. It's seeing God face to face with nothing held back. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, what are you looking for and hoping for in heaven? Let me ask you a question that perhaps should come before that. Do you ever look forward to being in heaven at all? 
The person who looks forward to death simply wants to get out of life because of his troubles. But that is not Christian. Rather, actually, that's pagan. The Christian, contrarily, has a positive desire for heaven. And therefore I ask, do you look forward to being in heaven? But more than this, what do we look forward to when we get to heaven? What is it we are desiring? Is it the rest of heaven? Is it to be free from troubles and tribulations? Is it the peace of heaven? Is it the joy of heaven? All those things are to be found there and we thank God profusely for them. But that is not the thing to look forward to in heaven. Rather, we look forward to beholding the very face of Yahweh. Joni Erickson Tata, who's a quadriplegic tied up into her wheelchair, she said, most people continue to think that getting a new body is my focus. But I want people to know that I can't wait to be clothed in righteousness. I can't wait so that there's not a trace of sin in my heart. For me, the best part of heaven is standing in purity and beholding the face of God. Jonathan Edwards said, the heaven I desire is a heaven of holiness. To be with God, to spend my eternity in divine love, beholding his face, and in holy communion with Christ. My mind is very much taken up with contemplations of heaven and the enjoyments there and living there in perfect holiness, humility, and love. Do you want to radiate Christ? Well, let me tell you this. Look forward to seeing the face of Jesus. When we have our hearts cast upon heaven and seeing and experiencing an infinite God who wants to pour out and give you everything. I mean, think about this. He's given so much already, but Jesus doesn't want to stop giving. He wants to give you all of him. Nothing withheld. If we are looking forward to that with such an intensity, I promise you that here, all of a sudden, the world is going to be like, what's the point of living for that? Why should I place my affections here when I've got that? Why should I worry when I know what awaits me in heaven? Do you long to be with him like he longs to be with you? Do you long to share what he is so eager to give you? Number seven, and last, do you pursue his glory? Do you pursue his glory? Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you've loved me before the foundation of the world. Trace this thought for a moment. I want them to see my glory that you, Father, gave me. You gave me this glory because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So the imagery is this. For all of eternity, the Father has been pouring out his love for the, under the Son, and that's enough. It's like the Father is, I don't need anything else. Give me my Son. He is enough for the Father. For all of eternity, the Father has been pouring out his love on the Son. And in order to demonstrate how much he loves his Son, he also eternally clothes his Son in glory. That glory is the demonstration of the Father's love to the Son. This is why the Son is also concerned with glorifying the Father, clothing in splendor, giving honor, because it's a demonstration of love. Now, let's tie this into the beginning. Jesus says, that demonstration of love, that glory you've given me, Father, I am giving to them. That the glory and the splendor that he gives to us is a demonstration of his love for us. Like it was a demonstration of the Father's love for the Son. And now the question is, do you also desire his glory? Because if glory is to ascribe glory, to clothe in splendor is the demonstration of true love, then are you striving to demonstrate your love by bringing glory to the Son? Through holy living, through obedience, through representing him, through going, through being... Jesus said, if you love me, you will what? Obey my what? My commandments. You'll, you'll bring glory to me by obeying, by listening, 
by following. And when you glorify me, you are testifying, I love my Jesus. Just like the father is testifying, my son is worthy of glory and I give him glory. I give him my glory because I love my son so much. And now my son has given these people his glory. And because my son has placed himself in their place and taken their pain, their sin in their stead. And because my son has given them his love and his glory, I will also pour out my love for all of eternity, bringing love and joy and affection to these whom my son loves. When we ask the question, what is your joy like? See, joy glories in the radiance of the sun. Joy loves to clothe in splendor who the sun is, what he has done. And that is done not in some ambiguous, mystical way, but in the practical things of, are you loving his church? Are you esteeming his name by guarding the harmony of that which he died for? Do you ache for the world that he longs to bring in? Do you esteem his humiliation, what he went through to give you glory? Do you recognize the love that he has given you? Do you long to be with him like he longs to be with you? And do you long to demonstrate your love by giving him the glory due his name? Weighty questions. If you would stand with me this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Bow with me as we enter the holy presence of God. Father, thank you that you have loved us even as you've loved your son. Help us to esteem and delight in and glorify your son as you do. Help our joy to be radiant like the face of Moses, like the fragrance of Christ that was upon the disciples that day before the Sanhedrin. May people truly take note that we have been with Jesus. May we recognize the gifts of the body of Christ, that we need each other. That you are building us up together to be a temple that proclaims your glory to the nations. Oh, Father, we have much to be thankful for this week, but before anything else, we want to say thank you for sending your Son to die on a cruel cross for our sins. May you be glorified in our lives this week as a demonstration of our love, Jesus. And in Jesus' powerful name, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. All God's people said? Amen. God bless. Have a blessed Sunday.